Good morning, all. My Verizon tower tells me it's one minute past our start time, so I will begin. Welcome to the Harmful Algal Bloom webinar series. My name is Eugene Bregg, and I'm Program Director for Aquatic Ecosystems Extension at The Ohio State University. I'll be your moderator today. This webinar is hosted by the Algal Bloom Action Team, of which The Ohio State University and myself are members. Um, the Algal Bloom Action Team is a collaboration of water professionals, researchers, and educators from 12 states in the North Central region of the United States. Team members include the National Network of Water Resources Research Institutes, which is sometimes abbreviated as one might expect, WRRI, the North Central Region Water Network and University Extension programs within each state of the North Central Region. In addition to hosting a webinar series, our team is developing a website of resources, including fact sheets and frequently asked questions on harmful algal bloom topics. I encourage each of you to visit our website, which I will post to the chat uh, feature after I have finished the morning's introductions. There you can explore some of the resources we have to date, including a what you should know fact sheet, a harmful algal bloom frequently asked questions database, recordings of previous webinars and of our virtual harmful algal bloom research symposium, which was held this past January. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we'll have a question and answer Q&A session after both our speakers have presented today. Please list your questions for our speakers in the Q&A panel, and we will do our best to address all of them following our presentations. There's a question already posted to the question and answer field, uh, and you have the same question. Please upvote that question so that we can prioritize those that are of greatest interest to our audience. Today's presentations are being recorded and will be posted to the Algal Bloom Action Team website following today's sessions. If you're having any technical issues or have any questions about the harmful Algal Bloom Action Team, please list those in the chat as well. And we will be happy to assist you as best we can. Today's presentations will focus on mitigating harmful algal blooms. And we have two great speakers lined up for you. Our first speaker is Calum White a phytoplankton ecologist from the Scottish Association for Marine Science. Dr. White is the deputy manager of the program for the presence of toxin producing plankton in shellfish production areas in Scotland. He's specifically interested in circa approximately 80 toxin producing microplankton species and what causes them to form harmful algal blooms as well as their distribution and how to predict uh, them as harmful algal blooms. I will stop sharing my screen now. So, Calum, you can share yours and take it away. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. White. Okay, thanks, Eugene. And thanks, Anne Marie, for inviting me along. Yeah, I'll just share my screen here. Okay. Can everyone see that? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. So. Sorry about this. It seems to be somehow something's high on. Still nothing coming up? Nope, not yet, oddly. Especially odd because it worked so well a matter of minutes ago. Two minutes ago, yes. Um, anyway. Again, ah. sorry about this, folks. It just seems to have frozen on me. Um. Oh, 
why don't we uh, switch around? Uh, Jai, would you be open to going first? And Caleb, if you could send me your PowerPoint slides, I will display them for you once uh, Jai has presented. Okay, sorry about this, guys. I'll um, I'll maybe leave and rejoin again, see if that helps. Thank you, Caleb. Well, let me skip ahead and thus introduce, well, <laughs> give me a moment again, and I will uh, bring up um, Shah's introductory slide. So flipping our agenda upside down, uh, allow me to introduce Xia Liu. Xia joined the School of the Civil Environmental and Infrastructure Engineering at Southern Illinois University Carbondale as assistant professor in 2015, where she was later promoted to associate professor in 2021. She was a water treatment specialist before that. She obtained her PhD from the University of Houston in 2014, her, her MS from Dunghua University, uh, China in 2006. Please correct me, Jia, if I butchered that too badly. That's correct. Um, <laughs> uh, in in that, her BS degree from Taiwan University of Technology in 2003, all in environmental engineering. Her research focuses on nanomaterial fabrication and application in water treatment fields, especially on remediation of contaminants of emerging concern. She's been awarded three national level projects from the US EPA, three regional level projects from Illinois Water Resources Center and Illinois Groundwater Association. Her presentations entitled Harmful Algal Bloom Mitigation by Magnetic Photocatalysts Under Visible Light, which is a field about which I know little and would like to know more, so I'm excited to hear about it. Uh, and it's uh, me on uh, my little cheat sheet that she will be our final presentation today, but prize, she will be our first presentation today. Uh, <laughs> once again, please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A panel, uh, and we will get to them after both our presenters have spoken. So, Sha, please take it away. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Yuji. Now let me share my screen. Can you see the shared screen? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so today I will present uh, the title of Harmful Algal Bloom Mitigation by Magnetic Photocatalyst under Visible Light. Uh, as introduced, I'm an associate professor at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. So first, as we all know, in freshwater, uh, harmful algal blooms are often associated with especially high concentrations of cyanobacteria. Uh, so the excess nutrient is uh, especially phosphorus in freshwater. Uh, their loadings coming from like wastewater or agricultural runoff can cause proliferation of cyanobacteria. Uh, so cyanobacteria can uh, produce cyanotoxins, for example, microcystin, uh, so that are harmful to both human health and ecosystem. So here, because of the cyanobacteria produce the cyanotoxin, the harmful algal bloom actually adversely impacted human health, economic viability, and recreational activities already in many communities in the U.S. So the objectives of this study first is actually to monitor harmful algal bloom before our mitigation. Okay, so uh, we monitored the harmful algal bloom in two lakes. One is Campus Lake of Southern Illinois University, that is my university. The other is Carmel Reservoir uh, by quantitative PCR method. So secondly, the objective here is as introduced to mitigate harmful algal blooms by the magnetic photocatalyst here uh, produced in our lab, gamma, ferric oxide, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And then we recycled the nanoparticles by their magnetic properties from the treated water for reuse. So thus we can reduce the addition of extra solids into the lake sediments. So first talk about our monitoring results. So here, as introduced, we focused on two lakes. One is SIUC Campus Lake. So this lake is about 40 acres in the area. The other is Carmendale Reservoir, which is a little bit larger, about 135 acres. Both lakes are used for hiking and the natural trip purposes, but have experienced harmful algal blooms, especially for the Campus Lake of SIUC. Actually, probably every other year, it will have 
harmful algal bloom issues. Uh, and in four or five years ago, actually, uh, we really uh, excavated the large or sediments from this lake, but still uh, the harmful algal bloom is, was back again afterwards. So it's really a severe problem. Uh, once the bloom is there, uh, so the campus lake cannot be accessed, really the recreational functions of the lake cannot be utilized there. And so here, these two maps shows the uh, three sampling sites we selected at both the SIUC Campus Lake and Carmendale Reservoir in the last year. So here we use the QPCR method as an early monitoring tool okay, for harmful algal bloom. So this method can detect toxigenic cyanobacteria even at very low concentration before it releases cyanotoxins into the water bodies. Cyanotoxin genes, for example, MCYE, uh, was actually utilized for targeting cyanotoxin, for example, microcystin producing cyanobacteria in this study. Oops. All right. Uh, so here, there are some more detailed methods here uh, for toxic cyanobacteria quantification. First is DNA extraction. Afterwards, we use the QPCR method. So uh, these are the list of the cyanotoxin genes that were utilized for targeting cyanobacteria. We use 16S rRNA gene for targeting all cyanobacteria species. MCYE gene for microcystin producing cyanobacteria, RPOC gene for selling jaws for mopsis bacteria, and then SXTA gene for sexy toxin producing cyanobacteria. The CT values were obtained from the amplification results. Uh, so here, just a brief introduction, the uh, CT values in uh, QPCR assay, so that is the number of cycles required for the fluorescent signal to cross the threshold. So normally a higher CT value, that means a lower initial gene copies uh, in the DNA extract. All right, so we also monitored the concentration of cyanotoxins. So uh, firstly, we use the uh, liquid chromatograph with a DED detector. And now we are developing methods using LC-MS-MS, so hopefully to better uh, monitor the different types of cyanotoxins. And then for phosphorus, we uh, use the Hox spectral photometer, use the method of ascorbic acid method to detect its concentration in the lake water. Uh, we also detected chlorophyll A concentration. Uh, so that is used to determine the biomass of all algal species. Uh, so it was extracted and analyzed by a UVB spectral photometer. Right, so for some monitoring results in last year, the chlorophyll A concentration in the campus lake of our campus uh, is between 6.4 to 1,800, 1,4.5 microgram per liter. So most of time, so this concentration is a lot higher than the eutrophication level of 26 to 75 microgram per liter. The phosphorus concentration accordingly most of time was a lot higher than the eutrophication level. But the cyanotoxin concentration, actually only the microcystin concentration is higher than the recreational threshold advisory of eight microgram per liter. So in the range of 9.95 to 38.8 microgram per liter from July to September last year. So here, this is the lake uh, when the bloom is there. And then you can see the water samples we taken, which is pretty greenish. Uh, so the highest temperature of the water temperature is about 31 degrees Celsius. Uh, for Carmendale Reservoir, actually, it's uh, a lot better. Actually, we did not observe obvious blooms there in last summer, uh, though sometimes the chlorophyll A concentration and the phosphorus concentration is higher than the eutrophication level, or slightly higher, okay, but really not as high as those concentrations in the SIUC campus lake. And then these are some typical monitoring results of the QPCR results. So last year, August and September. So you can see uh, the CT values for the toxic genetic genes that are actually higher than 16S RNA. Okay, so that is as expected. So that means the gene copies okay, are lower, okay, because uh, this 16S RNA was used for targeting all the cyanobacteria. And also here we can see uh, September 
data actually the gene copies for all different types of bacteria that are concentrations are higher okay than uh, the concentration in August last year. Okay, the bloom is more severe, uh, more severe in September last year. Uh, back in year 2019, we also did the monitoring and uh, we actually used a uh, flatable boat, uh, collected water samples along this lake for different 12 different sites. And here you can see the chlorophyll A concentration and also the CT values here. Okay. So all the cyanotoxin genes were detected that year in the campus lake. And the CT values of cyanotoxic genes were higher than that of 60S RNA as expected. And then we correlated the concentration of chlorophyll A concentration with different gene copies. And here you can see that we have strong correlation okay, between chlorophyll A concentration and the gene copy of 60S RNA. Okay, this means uh, so this method may be applied for cyanobacterial monitoring as an initial screen two for harmful algal blooms. Okay, just by uh, detecting the concentration of chlorophyll A, it may be an initial screening too. Okay, but for other toxigenic genes like MCYE, you can see the correlation of the gene copy of that gene with chlorophyll A concentration is a lot lower. Okay, so this R square is only 0.3 compared to 0.6 previously. And then for other two genes, CYRA and XXTA, okay, so the correlation are both lower. Okay, so these correlations indicate a chlorophyll A concentration alone cannot be used as a standalone indicator for harmful algal bloom monitoring, but qPCR test is actually needed to determine the concentration of each specific toxic cyanobacteria species. We okay, then talk about our uh, results of HAB monitoring by the magnetic nanomaterials. Uh, so first, why use the gamma ferric oxide titanium dioxide nanoparticles? Because they have three important properties. One is this nanocomposite can be easily recycled for reuse because of their magnetic properties. Okay, so that can reduce its aquatic toxicity to lake ecosystem. Secondly, the band gap of the nanocomposite is lowered by coupling titanium dioxide with narrower band gap semiconductor gamma ferric oxide. So titanium oxide is only responsible under UVA light by coupling with iron oxide. So the response can be shifted to visible light range. So which means it can utilize more of the energy from the solar irradiation. And then both of the oxides are actually biocompatible and has low toxicity. Okay, so this nanomaterial was synthesized through precipitation methods first. So that is using iron salts, titanium salts through cold precipitation, increasing the pH, and then we will uh, just expose this uh, powders to high temperature calcination under nitrogen and air flows, and then the powders were obtained. Okay, so these are the synthesized uh, nanomaterials. And then we characterized our materials, uh, first by scanning electron microscope and then by uh, transmission electron microscope. So you can see uh, most of the particles are spherical shaped and the uh, size are in the range from 15 to 100 nanometers. So that basically is in nanometer scale. Also, we used energy dispersive X-ray spectroscope to um, characterize our particles. So the weight ratio of titanium and iron is one to one in the produced nanoparticles. Uh, then dyna uh, dynamic light scattering results showed that about 8.45% of the mass percentage of the hydrodiameter of the nanoparticles are below 100 nanometer. Excuse me, I think it should start from zero. It's wrong here. Okay, so 8.45 below 100 nanometer. So uh, some of the particles, they get aggregated probably during the storage or sample preparation process. Uh, so then we also check the band gap. Okay, so the band gap energy from the absorption data. Uh, so this is using the UAV spectroscope, gets the absorption spectroscope, and then uh, use this talk plot method, we get the uh, band gap, which is around 2.3 EV. So that means the response is uh, in the visible light range. 
And so then we use the nanoparticles to mitigate harmful algal bloom, which includes three aspects. One is inactivating of the cyanobacteria. Secondly, photocatically uh, degrades the cyanotoxins. And thirdly, absorb nutrient phosphorus by the nanoparticles. Uh, so we conducted the experiments uh, first in the RNS water, then in the lake water samples. And so these are some of the possible mechanism of mitigation process. Uh, so first, there are some uh, phosphates, for example, autophosphate in the lake water, which will trigger the growth of cyanobacteria. So we want to absorb it, use the nanoparticles. And then the nanoparticle itself can also physically attack the cyanobacteria by breaking the cell wall, for example. And also under the visible light, right? So the reactive oxygen species, for example, Hydroxyl radicals or superoxide radicals can be generated. So these radicals have pretty strong oxidizing ability, so that can damage the cell wall or cell membrane, or it can also degrade the cyanotoxins. Okay, so the beauty of this technology is it is not only can just inactivate the bacteria, but also after bacterial inactivation, the released cyanotoxins can also be degraded. Okay, or in other words, it will not only targeting the cyanotoxin, but also it will targeting the bacteria which produce the cyanotoxin. Okay, so we can kill two birds. So here we have two pure cultures in the lab. Okay, one is the uh, silent jaw spermopsis species. The other is micro uh, cystis species. So you can see the size and the shape of micro cystis is a lot smaller and it's a bit spherical shaped, but this is like a fiber shaped. It's a lot longer. And then the water samples were interacted with the nanoparticles under the both uh, visible light or simulated solar light. Okay, so here are the light intensities we monitored. So for inactivation of uh, first of the pure culture microcystis, uh, so after interacting with the nanoparticles, the living cell culture were counted using a hematometer under an optical microscope. And uh, you can see the average percentage of cell reduction here under visible light. So the percentage is higher than under darkness. Uh, and when the concentration of nanoparticles was increased to one gram per liter, so this is use 100 mic microgram per liter, uh, interaction time is one hour. So if increase the concentration to one, so then uh, some higher inactivation uh, percentage can be obtained. Okay, so before interaction, the cells were spherical in shape, okay, but after interaction with the particles, we can observe some deformed shaped of particles. And then uh, for the qPCR study results, okay, we uh, showed the inactivation percentage is a lot higher. Okay, so uh, the deformed shape actually, uh, it may be blocked by the physical attack of the particles. And then uh, this part, uh, this, this cell can further expose the DNA okay, to a damage by the particles and lead to corresponding reduction of gene copies. So that's why here this inactivation percentage is a lot higher because uh, those deformed shells, when we count them, them as one cell, but actually uh, the gene copy is uh, already cannot be counted by the QPCR method. Okay, so for the Sanindro uh, uh, spermopsis species, uh, here a still similar result is there, okay, but no significant reduction was observed under dark, but we observed 33% reduction uh, just by counting the cells. Uh, for the QPCR result, okay, some higher percentage, a lot higher percentage was detected there from the QPCR result. Okay, so then we use the nanoparticles to inactivate cyanobacteria in the lake water. Okay, so from the uh, interaction result, we can see that under visible light, actually normally the result is better than under darkness. And when we increase the concentration of our particles from 100 milligram per liter to one gram per liter, actually the inactivation cannot be uh, increased much, probably because of the complex matrix in the lake water compared just in the pure culture environments. Okay, and then for another gene, similar result is obtained. Okay, so nanoparticles can effectively inactivate toxic cyanobacteria from the lake water, both in dark and under visible light, but better inactivation efficiency was in generally obtained okay, under visible light. Okay, so here, actually, if we have a closer 
an investigation, we can see that higher inactivation efficiency for MCYE was obtained, okay, compared to 16S and also SX. TA, that this may be related to the size of different cyanobacteria. The size of bacteria containing MCYE gene actually is a lot smaller. Okay, so remember it's spherical shaped. Okay, so uh, then those containing, for example, SXTA gene, which is about four to 50 micrometers. So that makes the inactivation efficiency to the MCYE gene containing bacteria a lot higher than the inactivation efficiency of other genes. So smaller surface area for MCYE containing bacteria increases their susceptibility when exposed to the same nanoparticles. The higher inactivation rate of MCYE containing cyanobacteria compared to other cyanobacteria also makes the inactivation efficiency of the MCYE higher compared to 16S RNA in general. Also, we uh, conducted the removal experiments used the nanoparticles uh, with interacting with cyanotoxins. So here this shows the result with microcysting. So with nanoparticle, we can see after one hour interaction, about 70% of the cyanotoxin was removed okay, compared to without nanoparticle, only 48% removed here. But more here, uh, more studies needed. Now we are developing the method for LCMS MS analysis. So hopefully more results will come soon here. And then for phosphorus removal, uh, so in the deionized water, okay, so if we start with 200 microgram per liter of phosphorus, then uh, we can see the uh, average absorption uh, percentage is 34%. Okay, for the phosphorus that is in the SLC campus lake, starting from more than 600 microgram per liter. So then the removal rate is lower. So when the concentration of phosphorus is lower in carbon dioxide reservoir, so this removal percentage is higher. Okay, so I think that makes sense. Okay, if you have higher concentration, then basically you have, have some lower removal rate. And then we also conducted the removal with time. So actually immediately after we added our nanoparticle to the composite water, so about 12% of phosphorus removal uh, can be achieved. Okay, so that is instantly uh, absorption. And then after one hour, so this removal percentage reached to 23%, but after three more hours, uh, after three hours, two more hours, actually uh, this uh, percentage cannot be increased much. So that's why we just uh, choose all the interaction to be one hour here. All right, so then our uh, particles can be separated after the interaction by its magnetic property put aside and then it can be recycled. So here are some conclusions. So first, two PCR method can be used for targeting toxic cyanobacteria, but chlorophyll A alone cannot be used to predict harmful algal blooms, maybe just used as a preliminary screen too for HABs. Uh, Lab-made nanoparticles can be used to inactivate uh, cyanotoxin-producing bacteria to remove the cyanotoxin. Here is MCLR and a sub-nutrient phosphorus under visible light. Better inactivation efficiency under visible light indicated possible application of this technology under sunlight for HAB mitigation. So in, in all, an innovative nanomaterial gamma uh, ferric oxide, titanium oxide was produced that can be used to mitigate harmful algal blooms in surface water to protect harmful, uh, to protect public health and surface water resources. All right, so these are the references we cited. So here, this study was sponsored by US EPA P3 project. So these are our, some of our most of our team members, including Dr. Lee and Dr. Gusang, and also uh, some graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, so really, our P3 team, thank you for your attention. All right, any questions? Thank you, Sha. We will, I think, get to questions after all of okay. our presentations are concluded, if that's okay. So give me just a moment as I shuffle through all of my open windows. I'm going quickly, uh, I'm not going to read the entire introduction again, but I do want to uh, bring back Dr. Calum White and remind you that he is an ecologist with the Scottish Association for Marine Science 
Uh, I won't repeat the whole of your intro, Dr. White, but uh, once again, uh, let's uh, let's take it away. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed that it works this time. Uh, that looks better. Can you see the screen now? I can indeed. Thank you. <laughs> well, sorry about that, folks. Uh, it's a little bit of a glitch at my side. Uh, so, uh, as Eugene said, I work at the Scottish uh, Association for Marine Science. So, on this first slide, I've got a couple of pictures. We're on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, we're probably two, two and a half hours away from Glasgow, but a big difference in size of population. Uh, it's not always sunny, as I've got to say. Uh, but it's sunny today. So what I'm going to talk about is the early warning system we have for HABs. And I should say we're, I'm mainly marine based rather than freshwater. Um, so I'll talk about how we got into this, uh, where we are now and where we're taking it, where we're going. So the Scottish Association for Marine Science um, monitors about 40 active shellfish growing sites every week to analyze about 1250 to 1300 samples during the, week, the year. And we do this for the Food Standards Scotland. So that's a government uh, body that looks after food health in Scotland. So samples, uh, samplers usually use these 10 meter loon tubes. They will use a bucket if they have to. Uh, they're sent back to our lab and we use the Utermol method to settle them. And this is just uh, one of our uh, lab assistants. Uh, this is normal speed, it's not speeded up at all. She's that good. So she's settling samples for us. So we analyze the samples using an inverted microscope, 200 times magnification. We use two chamber counts, or if it's a really a dense concentration of cells, we'll do a selected field of use. And basically every day we have to report our results to the Food Standard Scotland by 4 p.m. That's this top. Uh, top graph there and every week we do a summary and the summary is color coded, uh, green showing things are okay, amber for warning and red for trigger levels. If a trigger level is reached, that sends a message to the food standard uh, agency to have toxic tests carried out on those sites. So the way I got into this, um, I'm actually, believe it or not, an early career researcher. I only did my PhD back in 2012. So although this, this uh, monitoring system we had in place is quite robust, in 2013, there was a massive bloom of uh, dinophysis, which is a toxic um, dinoflagellate, which is up here. Uh, and this infected nearly all the sites on the west coast of Shetland. So the graph in the middle there, the yellow bar show you uh, Dinophysis, the green and red dots are showing the toxins. And what happened was uh, the sites tested uh, free of toxins, and two days later, the toxins had uh, gone about 20 times over the natural levels, the usual levels. So this caused uh, a big problem. The farm, one of the farms harvested the mussels, they were sent down to London, where uh, about 70 people reported. Uh, the symptoms of shellfish poisoning. So you can imagine if 70 people actually went to the doctors or the hospital, there's probably a lot more than that were actually infected. So this had a knock-on effect for uh, shellfish production in uh, Shetland. Um, Scotland bases its shellfish on pristine water, so this had a knock-on effect there. And then there was a wider halo effect that decided to affect Scottish aquaculture. So after this happened, uh, I just started as a postdoc at the Scottish Association, and um, we got a small grant to help uh, a group called Seafood Shetland, who are a, a group of um, shellfish growers in, in Shetland. Um, They're organized by the chief executive officer, Ruth Henderson, who's a young lady in the middle there. Uh, and they came to us and said, is there anything we could do to help mitigate um, the problems from HABs. Now up to then we had a sort of, there was an antagonistic um, relationship between the scientists and uh, the growers. Uh, they kind of felt we were maybe on the side of the regulators too much, uh, which I have to say wasn't the case. 
but this sort of changed their minds and they decided they really had to do something about it. So this was my first job. Um, I got a small grant to uh, produce a weekly bulletin just to give them a, an idea of what was going on. Uh, so initially I was just supposed to do a couple of bulletins just to see if it was possible under the terms of the grant. Uh, but I started to produce them weekly and I never stopped. So that was back in 2014. And um, they've grown from the first ones, which were just a couple of pages. Now there's about 12 different pages giving different information. So this is a, a summary page. Uh, on the top left, we have the various biotoxins we're concerned about. Uh, so we tell them how many sites have been tested, whether toxins were detected or not, and if they were detected, which sites were affected. Below that, there's a harmful algae report. So we tell them uh, the kinds of uh, causative phytoplankton that we got in the water. Again, what sites were affected and a little bit about the numbers. We then have a, the big blue box, which gives us some trends and forecasts, let them know what we think is going to happen in the, follow, in the week coming. And then at the bottom there, we have uh, a risk uh, matrix. And it just goes from low, moderate and high. The smaller inset box there showing the donuts. This is just the same information, but we find that some of the shellfish farmers uh, prefer the information as an infographic rather than lots of text. Uh, and again, these donuts just represent the island, to represent how many sites and which ones are affected or not. Uh, and again, we've got a, a green, yellow, amber and red traffic light system set up. So this has been fairly successful so far. Uh, this is the kind of maps they're given. So we give them the current week plus preceding three weeks. Uh, this is because there's a matrix for them to calculate the, the possibility of a risk of, of HABs that's been issued by Food Standards Scotland and it requires this four weeks of, of data. So we show them the, uh, uh, the several pages of this. We show them the map of the toxins in their sites. And below that, we show the causative phytoplankton that we're finding. So this gives the farmers a, a quick, easy way to see uh, where their site is and what's happening. We also started to show them forecasted sea surface currents. Uh, we can do this three to four days ahead. Um, and I should say that all this information is, is uh, information that we can garner freely. We don't get any or very little money to produce these things. There's a little bit of research money goes on, but most of it is, uh, is just our uh, our own work. So most of these uh, data products are free. The, this is a Mercator uh, forecast, and it's produced by a, well, an, an organization called Copernicus, uh, which was a, a, an EU project. We also do things like sea surface temperatures, which they find helpful, chlorophyll concentrations, although they're rather they're quite gross. There's a lot of interpolation given that we are very uh, cloudy up in Scotland. And we also give them wind direction and speed. This was one of the first maps we gave them because the, the large bloom that wiped out the, the industry in 2013, um, we actually found that it was advected from offshore. So the, the damifices didn't grow in situ. It, was, uh, it grew out on the shelf edge and then was uh, brought ashore from uh, anomalous winds that year. They were blowing from the west. So we just give them uh, again the status and we give them some predictions and an explanation of why we're making those predictions for them. So that's that's where the, the bulletin sort of stopped. It's about 12 pages and it's reached the limit for getting into people's email slots. It's about 11 megabytes. We can't give them any more information. So two or three years ago, we decided to go online and we created this interactive a web page. Uh, you can have a look at it. It's freely available to anyone who wants to log in. Uh, the map, you can zoom in and out of the map. You can zoom into Shetland if you want. Uh, if you click on any of the drop down boxes, you can change the year and the date. You can also change uh, what you're looking at. So this is a general alert. You could also have uh, the phytoplankton of different types and the toxins of different types. If you were to hover over any of these uh, little dots or stars, the name of the site, uh, when it was sampled and what was found there will, will show up on the screen. The blue triangles will take you to models, which I'll show you in, a, in the next slide. Um, 
you can download the report from the top left drop down box. You can select various model forecasts if they're within the range. Uh, and down on the bottom there, if you were to select any of the species, it will open up with a graph of the history and you can see whether whatever you're looking at was a problem in that site or not. So the modeling side of this was carried out by Dr. Dimitri Alenik. Uh, he's built a West Coast uh, Commons model, which is a, an unstructured model. So it can resolve itself into tiny little voles and sea lochs. Uh, it's very good. So if you were to click on one of those rectangular boxes and run the model, you'll see the bloom progressing, in this case, up the west coast of the, the Hebrides, sorry, the east coast of the Hebrides. The reason it changes color and size is this is just a particle tracking model. There's no biology built into it as such. Uh, we need nutrients to do that. It become far too computational heavy. So all we've done is put in a decay factor. So basically every 24 hours, the population decays by about 10, 10%. So it gives you an idea that, the, that this may not be true in reality. You might find a bloom that's actually growing as it moves, but, but most, they, uh, they start in a hot spot and as they get dispersed, they would, uh, the numbers would drop and they start to die off. Um, so these are various particle trails. The pictures there showing you how the, how the, uh, the blooms move. In some cases, we can see blooms originating in Scotland, moving over to Ireland, uh, and vice versa. It just depends on the currents at the time. Originally, in a, we had a pro, uh, project called Primrose, and we were working alongside the Plymouth Marine Laboratory with Peter Miller and Andrew Kurikin, and they developed uh, an algorithm to analyze satellite data, uh, ocean co color data, using the Sentinel-3 uh, platform. And in that, you could identify initially Terenia. So here's a few of the maps they would send us, and you'd see a bloom of Terenia, in this case, developing around Aran. They would then send us the, uh, the coordinates of this bloom, and Dimitri would use this to trigger off one of his models. So that's how the, the first models uh, were run. And we also run models from our monitoring program. So if we have find sites, where high numbers are detected, we can run a model using that as initiation point. And we can see if that uh, bloom is going to stay contained in the sea loch or whether it's going to spread. So here's a couple of uh, uh, pictures of the, 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 the spread of these blooms. And you can see they can travel quite far, quite a short time. So that's where we are just now with the, uh, with the website and, and the bulletin. And so now I'll just talk about work we've got going underway. So we're developing the same kind of website in uh, Malaysia. Uh, we're working with uh, Professor Lim, uh, Putin Lim at the University of Malaya and Will Harvey at SAMS. And we're using the same kind of data. We have a website as well. But in this case, we're putting onto uh, a mobile phone. So this phone is pretty much finished now. Um, so a farmer would log in, he would register with the system. Um, he can look, he can register just for his site if he wants, and he'll get alerts uh, to his mobile phone. Uh, he can also go onto a page where you'll get maps of all the sites in the area, and you can zoom into any of them and find out what's going on. So, once this is finished uh, in Malaysia, we'll probably be moving this across to Scotland and implementing that in our uh, shelf is monitoring project as well. And another new uh, Instrument we've got, I've just spent a, a week up in Shetland trying to get this uh, up and running, is the Imaging Flow Cytobot. So that was developed by uh, Hui, Heidi Sozik, and our colleagues, and it's uh, made by McLean Labs down in Massachusetts. So um, it's effectively a microscope that works underwater with a camera, and it photographs the phytoplankton in situ. So about every 25 to 30 minutes, it processes a five mil sample, which it sips in through some intake tubes, and it produces thousands of these images. So these are the kind of, this is just the, the a picture, a screenshot taken of the images it's producing. Um, and you can see they're, you know, you're quite capable of uh, identifying uh, the phytoplankton down to genus easily, in some cases down to species. And down here, there's a, a 
a picture of the Tosseres. That's just one of these images enhanced slightly and uh, enlarged. So basically it's about a meter tall by 26 centimeters wide. It comes in a titanium housing, which is depth graded to 40 meters. Um, you have um, a lamp that's running down, uh, a mirror knocks the light through a flow cell where it's uh, detected by a laser or chlorophyll is detected by a laser which sends a message up to a camera to take a photograph. And so this is just a sketch I've done to show you how it works. So the sample is taken into a syringe. It's working on flow cytometry uh, techniques. So basically you have an outer sheath flow that flows down and it's quite wide. So it's 860 microns by 180 microns. So if you've ever worked uh, in the sea, trying to uh, use flow, flow cams or cytometry, um, you're, you'll be aware that often it gets, they get blocked up because there's just so much detritus in a, in a sample of water that the normal flow cells block up very, very quickly. Because this has got such a large um, sheath flow, a lot of the detritus, uh, small sheath plants, things can pass right through. In the middle, there's an elliptical uh, core, which is about 150 microns by 33 microns. And that's a core that the phytoplankton will be uh, concentrated into. There's a slightly different rate of flow between the sheath and the core. And that means that any long chain forming uh, diatoms get flipped up and they pass through long ways. Um, down the bottom, there's a lamp, bounces off a mirror uh, to the camera, and we also have a laser that fires onto the detector. If a particle is detected by the laser, so it can be set to scatter or it can be set to uh, chlorophyll, it goes to the detector and that triggers the camera, which then takes a, takes a picture. And um, the one that was in the photograph, it's been in Shetland for uh, about a year. It was being looked after by a PhD student, but she, uh, she retired from the program. And that machine has basically been sitting there running away for a year without any kind of maintenance. And it's been producing good results for that entire time. It actually, it only stopped when we went to clean it last week. We decided to do some maintenance and clean it and it actually stopped when we tried to do that. So uh, um, it's best to leave it alone. So as I said, this can sit uh, in the sea in situ, it can go down to 40 meters, but we've actually got ours uh, in, in, a, in an outside shed effectively in a former hatchery pump house at the Fishers College uh, in Shetland in Scalloway. And we are pumping the water from the sea through this, uh, the pump, I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, but the pump here, uh, it's an impeller pump, it's an industrial one, so it's really for constant use. Uh, the reason this is here is because this is our first one, we wanted to test it, make sure we had all the glitches worked out before we, uh, we deployed it. And um, we also have to find a secure place to deploy it. This thing costs about 150,000 pounds, dollars for you guys. Uh, so we're a bit reluctant just to leave it hanging at the end of our buoy. Our fishermen here tend to, when they find a new buoy, they pull it up to try and see what's on the bottom of it. Uh, you can't always guarantee they'll throw it back in again. So, so we've got the instrument, it's producing these pictures and we can use it to get an idea of what's in the water, but we can go a lot further with that. So the idea that what the PhD student was working on was this artificial intelligence. So more specifically using convolutional neural networks to try and identify and enumerate what's in the sample. Um, I'm not a data scientist, uh, I'm, I'm not even a coder. Um, so this is a little bit beyond me, but basically it, it takes in, the, the input. It, it doesn't see the pictures, it just sees, a, the software just sees a grid of numbers um, for each pixel. Um, it, you then pass a filter through this, which is like a small three by three pixel by three pixel matrix. Uh, which is just a pattern detector. And each one of these will detect a different pattern. It just strides through the image, uh, calculating uh, a, a, new, um, a new value for, for each set, and it passes them onto these feature maps, many, many, many feature maps. These are then condensed down. 
and subsampled or pooled uh, to, to reduce the amount of data that's needed for processing. And it, and it goes through various contributions until eventually it's, uh, it's compared with the output and uh, you look at a library of images and it will come up with a probability of which one it thinks it is. There's lots of uh, videos on YouTube and things showing you how this works if you're more interested in it. It's quite fascinating. But to do that, the machine has to be trained. So it can't just do that on its own. Uh, and although it's artificial intelligence, it's probably a lot more artificial than intelligent. It's just using some basic algorithms. So we have to show it lots of different pictures. Uh, to train it, it needs at least a thousand images for any one class, uh, which could be a genus or a species. Uh, and to produce these images, we have to identify them by a trained taxonomist. And this takes a, quite a bit of time. So today at SAMS has classified about 60,000 images. Uh, we've still got a long way to go. Um, and to speed things up, we've joined with the SciFCB European Users Group. Um, we estimate there's about nine, nine IFCBs in all of Europe. Uh, the UK has got two of them. Um, in comparison, I think there's nine uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. That I didn't run for you guys. So you, you've, you have a lot more of them than we do. Um, so we basically have a, a groups from Finland, France, Germany, Norway, Sweden, and the UK. And our idea is to use this uh, really nice um, web, website called Nordic Microalgae. It's hosted by the SMHI in Sweden. Uh, and we'll the plan is for us to upload our training sets uh, onto this website, and then they can be downloaded by various partners. Uh, because our waters are quite similar to Scandinavia and Scotland, it means we'd have an awful lot more images to use, uh, and it'll give us uh, a better chance of building classifiers uh, much, much quicker. Um, so that's where we are now. That's uh, where we, we hope to, to go. So the aim is to automatically identify these species or genera generate the cell counts, calculate the biomass, uh, and provide real-time alerts, as well as to get uh, long-term data sets that we can use for trend analysis and help us in our, uh, our forecasts. To go along with this, we've also built a sensor chain, which I was just deploying as well. Uh, so the picture is Michael Tate, one of the muscle farmers, and he's deploying this sensor at one of the, the long lines in his muscle farm. So I should say there's nothing down there. There's no muscles hanging on the rope. That's an empty uh, piece of water. So this is built by uh, Phil Anderson, uh, one of our robotics managers here. Um, it's basically a bit of drainage pipe. It's welded together. It's got a power sensor on the top. Uh, and below it, it has a chain. It has seven, seven different nodes at different depths. And these nodes record temperature uh, and power. There's also two chlorophyll sensors. Uh, one at four, one at 10 meters, and a turbidity sensor. And this is given real time information on the water structure. So this is the, this is some of the data that we got back just after we installed it. And um, he's still working on his, his web page. And um, being a robotics engineer, Phil sees the world in a different way than I would. So we can't even interpret some of his graphs. So we, we have to keep prodding him to produce nice, easy graphs depth and temperature that we can understand. Uh, and he hasn't, he hasn't uh, his web page is not set up to, to display the chlorophyll, the turbidity yet. But we can already see some of the structure in the water. So this is to go alongside the, uh, the IFCB. Uh, and using both of these, we want to see how the phytoplankton population varies with the, with the water structure and uh, temperature. And we're also looking at some uh, um, in, in situ real time uh, nutrient sensors as well. So that's all I've got to say. So we didn't do this alone. So I've got to acknowledge the various uh, funders we've had through the through the years we've been doing this. Uh, so there's a nice list there. Uh, so they've been very generous with us. Um, the European Fisheries Fund has managed to always find us, uh, and CP Chetland always managed to find us a little bit of money to keep bouncing along. Okay, so. Thanks very much, and sorry for the mix-up at the beginning. Thank you, Dr. White.
And do you mind, uh, thank you, doing exactly that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's quite all right. So the questions are starting to come in. I want to encourage all of you once again to please post questions in the chat as you have them uh, and upvote those that are already posted if they're related uh, to what your interests are. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the Algal Bloom Action Team's webinar series. Thank you so much. Special thanks to our presenters, of course, Kayla and Ja, for sharing their research with us. Also, as always, a thanks goes to Anne, uh, Anne Nardi and her team at the uh, North Central Region Water Network for hosting the webinar, coordinating all the technical aspects, et cetera. We could certainly not do it without her and them. So um, I'm going to start um, reading off some questions based upon those that were most upvoted. And uh, so far, uh, all the questions are related to Ja's presentation. Uh, and I'm, there are three that are most upvoted that are all closely related to each other. So I'm going to kind of summarize them, Ja, uh, and then you can address them as you see appropriate. And it's mostly related to whether or not this is uh, the technology you described is applicable only to, for example, commercial scale uh, water treatment plant application, or if it might have applications for the wild as well. And if it does have applications to the wild, there were a lot of questions about whether or not you've, you've tested things like the effects on non-target organisms, uh, if the nanoparticles persist in the environment and what side effects they might have, et cetera. So depending on where the first part of the question goes, the second part might not be relevant. Well, thanks uh, for the, all of these questions. I think very valid and important questions uh, for the development and real application of this technology. So currently uh, this project is sponsored by phase one of the EPA P3 project. So uh, our phase two proposal, uh, EPA already in Intended for uh, the intention for uh, funding for the phase two proposal. So in there, we will develop a point of use system, POU system. Uh, so uh, that is a uh, bigger treatment unit that can handle probably more than 100 gallon of water. Uh, so that will uh, be hosted by a floating system in the lake so that can uh, go to uh, those hot spots which will have more of the harmful algal blooms. For example, in the campus lake, actually, it's uh, not all the lake has this bloom. You can see only uh, in some specific locations, actually, they are obvious, especially uh, for those areas which like a harbor uh, area is relatively smaller. The temperature, if you check for the water, is slightly higher than the temperature elsewhere. Uh, so those hot spots, I think, will be our target. Uh, so uh, I think whether it's for entire lake or for only some commercialized purpose, I think we need to start from uh, some hot spots. And then uh, after we have this uh, POU system uh, uh, utilized, so then we can really calculate the cost or effectiveness. Uh, and now uh, the technology actually, uh, this nanoparticle is one good thing is easy to be manufactured. Uh, we can easily uh, enlarge the manufacturing dosage. Okay, so for uh, some higher uh, amount of application. And secondly, this particle has already been uh, utilized for not only inactivate cyanobacteria, but also inactivate uh, other, actually we started from uh, the bacteria in wastewater effluents. So we want to use it as an alternative method uh, for wastewater uh, bacteria in, uh, disinfection. Uh, so it can inactivate E. coli, enterococci, or some total coliform in general in wastewater effluent. Uh, so of course, uh, the nan nanoparticle on the ribolite will not only uh, kill the cyanobacteria, but may also kill other good <laughs> algae species also. Uh, but I think what we can do is we can uh, just improve the uh, manufacturing of the particle to make it more specific to targeting the toxic cyanobacteria species. Uh, but anyway, the technology like just for uh, killing the cancer cell also may kill good cells also. Right? Uh, so it also has this issue, but that's something we need to pay attention to, to better modified particle in the future. Yeah, I don't know whether it's answered all the <laughs> questions mentioned, but you can. 
Thank you, Ja. Well, we are, uh, I appreciate that answer and that's a, an excellent start. Uh, we are though about out of time. I do want to post it out, Calum, that um, there were at least a couple comments um, in the chat posted regarding what an excellent use of the technology you're making and especially what an excellent use of partnerships you're making. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, call it and I would encourage if, if you don't mind, Calum and Ja, uh, please write to Kayla and Ja with their questions that remain unanswered. I have put their, uh, their email contact information on the final slide. Check the chat, please. There's a survey associated with today's webinar and the um, web page for the Algal Bloom Action Team has been, has been linked a couple times in the chat. So check those things out as well. Uh, I want to remind you that our webinar series continues bi-monthly throughout 2022. The next one will be on the 3rd of August, once again at 11 a.m. Central Time. That is 12, of course, Eastern for the few of us that are that far east. Um, and once again, thank you, Calum and Ja, for enlightening presentations. Uh, you, good. Thanks very much. I should, oh, go ahead. Thanks. And I'm just saying thanks very much for uh, giving me a chance to talk. It's been lovely. I really appreciate it, both of you. Um, anything else I need to call before uh, before we wrap, Anne? I think we're good. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you so much, all. And again, please do complete the survey. Please do join us once again August 3rd. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>